Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We will start today uh, our survey of those theories studying war and peace, those theories ego to explain why wars regularly break out, and those theories that uh, look for the conditions permitting peace to prevail. Just as in our introductory chapter, we started, or I started, with the definition of war before proposing a fairly negative definition of peace, we will dedicate the first chapters, the first substantive chapters of these lectures on theories of war and peace. The first chapters will be dedicated to the causes of war, to those the theories that explain why wars break out. Chapters two to five, not two to six, I created the confusion last week anyway. And we then, from chapter six to nine, we will have a look at those theories focusing on the conditions of peace. A general remark before going into the details of these causes of war, of these theories looking at the causes of war. Last week, I emphasized the kind of contradiction. Nobody is foolish enough to prefer war to peace, everybody prefers peace to war, and yet regularly wars break out. War exists in whatever historical period, war, to quote Bertolt Brecht, wars always find a way. If the two statements are true, and they probably are, then the conclusion concerning the study of the causes of war is obvious. War is not correlated to human will, to human wishes, to human preferences. Wars are due to causes out of the reach of the control, the goodwill, the choice of any human being considered individually. Where then are the major causes of war to be found, this is the question we will try to provide an answer to in the next four chapters. If we look at past explanations or contemporary explanations of why wars break out, we can locate the causes that were proposed, that were put forward by the different theorists, by the different philosophers, authors. We can locate these causes within the nature of human beings, the nature of men, within the domestic political regimes of collective units, and within the international system, the interstate system, the system of states. These three estimates of the causes of war, ladies and gentlemen, have been referred to as the three images of international politics, the three images of international politics by Kenneth Waltz in his first book, actually his PhD dissertation, Man, the State and War. And he defines each image, the first, the second, the third, he defines each image according to, I quote, where it locates the nexus of important causes. What's this book was criticized positively. There was a, a command on this book published two years later in 1961 by David Singer, he who a little bit later started the Cow Project, the Corrades of Wool Project. I mentioned this project last week. In an article called The Level of Analysis Problem in International Relations, The Level of Analysis Problem in International Relations, and I will stick to both Singers and Waltz's proposal. So we will look first at those explanations locating the major causes of war at the first level of analysis or the first image, that is to say, human nature. And the decision making process of individual statesmen and stateswomen launching a war, deciding that a state should go to war. Then we will, this is chapter two. Then we will get today's chapter. Then we will look at those causes located at the level of 
the second image, the collective domestic political, re domestic political regime of a collective unit, chapter three. And in chapter chapters four and five, we will look at the third image, the systemic level of analysis, locating those explanations that locate major causes of war at the level of interactions, either of two or three more states or the whole structure of the international system. Chapter two then today, if you look at the syllabus, the title of today's class, decision-making and war, cognitive perceptions and organizational constraints. War we said last week when uh, uh, having a look at the different definitions proposed by uh, various uh, thinkers. War is a social activity. That is to say, it opposes collective units who use political, who use armed violence in order to achieve, in order to obtain a political satisfaction, in order to promote, defend their national interests in their interactions with other states. So it is a social activity, but a war is the consequence of specific decisions taken by one man or one woman. And this, I think, is the reason why we should. The first question we can ask, we should ask as the first question, whether there is an implicit or an explicit relationship between first human nature and war, since human beings take the decisions to go to war. And the second question is whether there are links between the decision-making process, the characteristics of decision-making processes, and the outbreak, the regular outbreak of war. Let's start with the first question. Is there a link between human nature and war? Can the regular outbreak of wars be ascribed to specific features characterizing human nature? Well, this is indeed what many political thinkers of the past thought, at least in the history of Western political thought. War is, has been, was pretty often considered to be the consequence of human nature. Human nature in general, characterizing mankind and not specific individuals. Evil leaders such as Hitler, such as Stalin, such as uh, Saddam Hussein, maybe such as George W. Bush. So it's human nature characterizing mankind in general, which here is put forward. First by the Greek Thucydides, who was, who he can be considered as the first both historian and international relations scholars in his history of the Peloponnesian War. This is the, the French uh, translation. We come back to him in chapter five because he thinks that the Peloponnesian War was due to the expansionism of Athens, the growth of Athens, of Athens and the fear. Uh, which this growth inspired to Sparta. Sparta thus was forced to start a war which escalated into the Peloponnesian War. So there is a systemic explanation, but, and here we come back to today's chapter, the growth of the power of Athens, the expansionist ambitions of Athens are traced back by to Kennedy's himself, to human nature. Listen to what he wrote, or what he put in the mouth of the generals of the army of Athens when attacking, or when being about to attack the city state of, Mel of uh, Melos. It's the so-called famous Melian dialogue. This is what the generals said. It is a necessary law of their nature that men dominate wherever they can. So there is a kind of human characteristic, there is a characteristic within human nature which incites them to dominate other men. 
this idea of Thucydides was shared many centuries later by Thomas Hobbes, the British, the English philosopher, who translated uh, the history of Peloponnesian War into English before writing in his, his treaty, his Leviathan. And this is what he wrote in his Leviathan. Listen to Thomas Hobbes. In all times, kings and persons of sovereign authority, because of their independence, are in continual jealousies. And in the state and attitude of gladiators, having their weapons pointing, their eyes fixed on one another, their forts, their garrisons, and their guns, upon the frontiers of their kingdoms, continual spies upon their neighbors, which is an attitude, a posture of war, an attitude of war. Why? Because of human nature. Indeed, you know this, the Latin expression, homo, homini lupus est, man, in Hobbes's political philosophy, is a wolf to another man. Three sentences i think deserve to be quoted first of all listen to this i put this is chapter 13 of the leviathan i put for a general inclination of all mankind a general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceases only in death so men desire to be more and more powerful in their relations with other men first Quote, second quote. In the nature of man, in the nature of man, we find three principal causes of quarrel. First, competition. Second, diffidence. Third, glory. The first, competition, makes men invade other men for gain. You want to be richer than your neighbor. The second, diffidence makes men invade other men for safety. You do not trust other people because of their evil nature. So what do you do? You attack them preventively. And the third glory makes men invade other men for reputation. Men are proud and they want to be more prestigious. They want to have a better reputation. They want to be perceived with honors by others. So the nature of men the inclination of all mankind, and the third quote, the miserable condition of war, which characterizes the state of nature of men when they are living in the state of nature before creating a political unit. The miserable condition of war is necessarily consequent to the natural passions of men. The natural passions of men, and he repeated, he repeats, sorry, once again what he wrote. In the, the second quote that I gave, men are continually in competition for honor and dignity. And consequently, amongst men, there arises on that ground envy and hatred, envy, hatred, and finally war. Men go to war against each other because they hate each other. Thomas up, very pessimistic. The American theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, in his book, Moral Man and Immoral Society, Niebuhr introduced political realism during the 30s in the US. So he's to some extent a, uh, one of the, the founding fathers of American classical realism. And in this book, he characterizes men to be characterized, he thinks that men are characterized by their will to live, and their will to power, the will to live, the will to power. Nemo also influenced Obama's foreign policy vision. His approach, his specific kind of realism is sometimes called Christian realism because of his theologian overall philosophy. And Nemo directly or indirectly influenced the, the Pope of American classical realism, Hans Morgenthau, German origin, he went to the US because of the, the Nazis coming to power in Germany. And in his most famous book, The Bible of Classical Realism, Hans Morgenthau, who is eager in this book to 
to, to propose, to present the theory of international politics. In order to explain why politics is a never ending struggle for power and peace, the subtitle of his book. Morgenthau, this is what he wrote, realism, since he considers himself to be a realist, in his criticism of idealism, the then prevailing approach in the US and, and in the UK during the war period. Realism believes, I quote, that the world is the result of forces inherent in human nature. Forces inherent in human nature. Realism believes that politics, like society in general, is governed by objective laws that have their roots in human nature. And this human nature did not change. Since I quote the classical philosophies of China, of India, and of Greece, to kid it is, human nature did not change since the classical philosophers, the classical philosophies in China and India, and in Greece discovered these laws. So what then uh, is the world consisting in? What does the world look like? The world is inherently, listen to this, a world of opposing interests and of conflicts among them. Why? Because of, and here is the explicit reference to human nature, because of those biopsychological drives common to all men, the drive to live, the drive to propagate, and the drive to dominate every man and therefore every state, because the state's behavior roots in human nature, every man is characterized by its eagerness to live, to survive, but also to propagate, to diffuse his ideas, and to dominate, to eliminate uh, challenges or adversaries in general. So human nature indeed was put forward by thinkers of the past as basically explaining why wars break out. These explanations nowadays are no longer uh, considered to be scientific, are no longer taken seriously in the modern conception of international relations theories. First of all, because the assumption that human nature is inherently evil, that we are egoistic, aggressive, eager to dominate, etc. This assumption is not shared, not even in the past, by the philosophers. According to Locke, for instance, who criticized Hobbes, the state of nature among men is rather a state of cooperation, sometimes interrupted by results to violence. But man is not basically violence. He has a kind of neutral conception. Better still, Rousseau, to some extent Montesquieu, but above all, Rousseau considers man in the state of nature, the so-called noble savage, to be inherently good. It is society which perverts men, but not human nature itself. And if we look beyond these more or less metaphysical claims, if we look at the concrete behavior of men and women, of individual human beings in their everyday life, well, and this is what Kenneth Waltz is doing in his Man, the State at War, what do we see? We see that, according to Kenneth Waltz, there are evidences of men's behavior as rapes, as murders, as thefts. Yes, sometimes men are evil, but there are also counter evidence of men uh, acting with charity, with love, with self-sacrifice. And these counter evidence would tend to prove that men are, and women are inherently good rather than inherently evil. So the metaphysical starting point of Thomas Hobbes, of uh, uh, Hans Morgenthau, Tukidides is of course hardly convincing. But nevertheless, let's imagine that human nature indeed is basically evil. If this is true, then Hobbes, who was the founding father of contemporary philosophy, contemporary classical realist philosophy, then Hobbes does contradict himself. You know that according to Thomas Hobbes, 
men are inherently evil and therefore they are wolves to other men in the state of nature. Life is, I quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short because people, men, kill each other. There is no place for industry. There is no culture. There are no arts, no letters, no society and worst of all, I quote, there is a continual fear and danger of death. Since man is a wolf to another man, every man is afraid of dying, of being killed. So human nature explains this never-ending state of war. But, but, and here is the contradiction. Men are able to get out of this state of nature and therefore out of this state of war. The possibility exists, according to Hobbes, I quote, to come out of the miserable and short life of the state of nature, partly because of men's passions and partly because of men's reason. Men's passions, his fear of being killed, drives him, incites him to look for a solution. And men's reason, his willingness to live a better life, to benefit from the fruit, of his efforts. Insight meant to do what? To sign a social contract. That is to say, to establish a particular unit, to create the so-called sovereign representative, central government, we can call it, which guarantees the security of everybody, the survival of everybody. In other words, the one and only evil human nature explaining the state of war does not prevent men from looking for a solution to get out of this state of war. But there, here, here we have a kind of contradiction. Either human nature is inherently evil, jealous, egoistic, aggressive, but then it is impossible for men to organize a peaceful society. Or it is possible for men to organize such a political unit guaranteeing the security of everybody. But if this is possible, then men are not inherently evil, aggressive, since they look for a solution. And what's more, and what's more, according to Hobbes, states, I quote, are but artificial men. States are but artificial men. States are men gathering together. The nature of men therefore also prevails at the level of states. But if this is true, then states too should be able to get out of the state of nature, of what nowadays we call anarchy. But according to Hobbes, this is not the case. States, political units, are in never-ending state of war, I quote, because of their independence, because they remain independent. So states which are but artificial men, which are not different, from, uh, from men, states are unable, contrary to men, to sign a social contract among themselves in order to establish a central authority. So here we have a contradiction. To put it bluntly, to put it shortly, the main problem of those theories ascribing wars to human nature, to a fixed human nature, defined as evil, as, 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 aggressive, as aggressive, as bad, as jealous, as egoistic. The main problem is that human nature remains the same, whether states fight or not. Human nature can explain why a war existed in 1914 and why a war broke out in 1939. But the same human nature prevailed when there was no war in 1912 or in 1938. So there is no empirical corroboration of human nature explaining why wars sometimes break out and why sometimes they do not break out. And this is what Kenneth Walls sums up in his critical assessment of these theories referring to human nature. Human nature, I quote, cannot by itself explain both war and peace. 
except by the simple statement that man's nature is such that sometimes men fight and sometimes they do not fight. And of course, this statement leads us to what? It leads us to look for discriminatory causes. It, look, it incites us to look for explanations, permitting us to understand why sometimes men fight and why sometimes they do not fight, whatever their human nature bad or according to other people, to other authors. Good. So we have to look for the major causes of war elsewhere than within the human nature. We have to look for and we have to find discriminatory factors that explain the warlike behavior of some states in certain periods and the peaceful behavior of the same states in other periods. Human nature, therefore, was more or less abandoned as an explanation, though some authors try to do so. If you look at the biography, Stefan Rosen published a book pretty recently, uh, War and the Human Nature, but he remains fairly isolated with his explanation. I, therefore, take another direction. I will look at the decision-making process, which is always located, which is still located at the individual levels of analysis. We will not look at the human nature of decision makers uh, launching, taking the decision to go to war, launching wars, initiating wars, but we will look at how the decision making process of individual decision makers, presidents, prime ministers, kings, etc., secretary generals, how these decision-making process may contribute to favor the outbreak of war. So let's look at the analysis of decision-making processes. In the discipline of international relations, there are two conceptions of decision-making. The first conception, decision-making is a rational process. That is to say, these approaches consider that a statesman or a stateswoman is perfectly rational when deciding to go to war and in general when deciding whatever political action. And then we have those models, those approaches who emphasize that the statesman, just as every man and women like you and me, that the statesmen and stateswomen, statewomen Rationality is limited, is bounded, is anything but perfect. So very quickly, the rational actor model, the rational actor model claims that statesmen know what they do, that they are able to take consistent decisions, value, interest maximizing decisions, that is to say they know perfectly what their resources consist in, the resources of their states, their, their capacities, their power capabilities. They know what the other states' resources consist in. They know what the other states' main intentions are all about. So they have perfect information. They are able to rank rationally, logically, their own preferences. I would like to obtain this or that or that. And then they are able, of course, to anticipate the consequences of a policy looking for the first objective or the second or the third, etc., etc. And once they have undertaken all this, all these calculations, they take the decision which will permit the state either to maximize its interests, its advantage, or at least to minimize the disadvantage. So it's the rational cost advantage calculation which characterizes statesmen and stateswomen. And actually, once the decision was put into practice, once the action was undertaken, the policy is evaluated. And if it was successful, the statesman sticks to it, goes on with it. If it is not successful, he changes the policy and opts for another alternative action, etc. etc. This a rational actor model is implicitly or explicitly the one uh, put forward by classical realists such as Morgenthau. Morgenthau, in his Politics of Motivation, claims that statesmen think 
and act in the terms of the national interest. The national interest defined in terms of power. States look for more and more power. Statesmen know what the national interest consists in. They act irrationally. And the same is true for Henry Kissinger, both practitioner and uh, historian, academic, before becoming practitioner. In his Diplomacy, the huge book that they published in 1994. Diplomacy is a kind of um, gallery, portrait gallery, gallery of portraits of famous statesmen, diplomats or statesmen, rational to be enough to be successful. And he starts with Richelieu, the French statesman, goes on with uh, Metternich, the Austrian the negotiator during the, the, the Vienna Congress, Bismarck at the origin of the German unification. And of course, himself, he considers himself to be a rational diplomat. He was a classical, still is, he's still alive, a classical realist, just a small in town. Both were classical realists, both believed or postulated, ill or postulated, assumed, uh, posited the rationality, the perfect rationality of statesmen, and yet they did not agree regarding the Vietnam War. Kissinger considered, and he was one of the main actors of this war, considered this war to be a war fought to defend America's national interest. Morgenthau did not agree with that. He actually thought that it was a kind of crusade. So two classical realists sharing the same starting points, the same assumptions, do not uh, evaluate uh, the same one of the same uh, political decision in this case the Vietnam War the same way they, they differ in the interpretation this of course tends to prove that those who criticize this rational actor model are closer to the truth to the empirical truth so what then do these critics say the critics started in the 50s and the 60s during uh, the so-called behavioral revolution in American social science and therefore also in American international relations. According to these critics, those who claim that the statesman or stateswoman are, is, perfectly, is perfectly irrational forget two main points. First of all, a statesman hardly is the only decision maker. He is part, even the president, prime minister, is part of an administration. And this administration shapes the decision-making process and influences the final decision, which indeed will be taken by the decision-maker. But after a process where the administration, the organization to which the final decision-maker belongs, where this uh, organization uh, has an impact. And then the second criticism consists in saying that a statesman does not perfectly know, objectively know, the situation which he or she has to cope with. The information at his or her disposal is not perfect. And therefore, pretty often, a statesman or stateswoman um, perceives reality subjectively rather than objectively. So let's look at these two sets of Critical approaches, they were used to explain why sometimes some wars break out. We will start with the first criticism. Decision makers are surrounded by an organization. And the American author who proposed this explanation is Graham Allison. In his analysis of the Cuban Missile Crisis, this is the first edition this is the second edition. The second edition uh, was published 30 years later, 1971, 1999, as far as I remember, when the archives were opened, the archives of the, the Cold War, which permitted Alison and Zelikov, the historian, to look at the historical evidence of what Alison Small put forward as early as 1971. It was his PhD dissertation too. So Graham Allison criticizes the perfect rational actor model and proposes two alternative models, the so-called organizational process model 
and the so-called bureaucratic politics model. I will focus on the first one because it can be used to explain why specific wars broke out in the past. So what does this organizational model consist in? I, have, I do not have the time to go into the details of the Cuban Missile Crisis and Alison's own analysis of it. Anyway, so in the, in, in the study of causes of war, the organization constraint, the, the organizational process model was used to um, account for some specific wars. I'll give you immediately the two empirical examples. So according to this model, the organizational process, administrations, and therefore including the statesmen or the stateswomen sitting on the top of an organization, of an administration of a government. Organizations, when they take decisions, are characterized by organizational routines. They act according to standard patterns of behavior. What does that mean? This means that the decision that is taken, for instance, the decision to go to war, that is taken in the point of time t will be hardly different from the decision that was taken in the point in time t minus one. And it will be followed by a decision very similar taken in the point in time t plus one. Standard patterns of behavior, routine decisions. Roughly, the decisions look like other decisions always already taken and will be followed by pretty similar decisions in the future. This model has been applied to two empirical cases, World War One and Operation Desert Storm, the American operation against Saddam Hussein in 1990. Let's look at the first empirical example, World War One. You know the immediate cause of World War I, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. He was to become king. Killed by a Serbian terrorist, activist, nationalist. And according to the organization model, if this assassination, which at the beginning only concerned Serbia and Austria, if this assassination escalated into a major world war involving all the major powers. It is because of the then existing military plans. The different governments had their hands tied by the military plans, in other words, by organizational constraints. So let's look at the details. Austria could not permit to leave this assassination unpunished. So what did Austria do? It declared war to Serbia. But Austria, in the months and years preceding this assassination, did not consider Serbia as the main adversary. It considered Russia to be the most important and the most threatening enemy. So what does that mean? This meant that the, Rus the Austrian army, when planning, when considering a possible war, had elaborated occupation plans of Russia, not of Serbia. So what did Austria do? It declared war against Russia, all the more so since Russia was Serbia's closest ally. Russia, in its turn, had two major enemies, Austria, but also and first and foremost, Germany. And Russia could not conceive of a war against Austria without also conceiving of a war against Germany. So Germany was dragged into the conflict because of the then existing military plan. Germany, you know that of course, had two main enemies, Russia on the east, France on its western border, you know that Germany became Germany thanks to Prussia's victory against France in 1870. 
and Germany expected that sooner or later France would try to reconquer Alsace-Lorraine lost in 1870. Alsace model actually lost in 1870. So what did the German military plans consist in? They first consisted in attacking France, defeating France, and in the second, during the second moment, attacking Russia. So Germany could not imagine a war without also going to war against, against uh, without also waging a war against France. So France was dragged into the conflict too, according to this model. I do not claim that this is the perfect explanation. I just try to apply this, uh, the framework of the organizational process model to, to try to explain how within this framework we can explain why World War I escalated. What's more, the German military plan, the von Schlieffen plan, considered that France should be attacked not by crossing the Rhine River, somewhere in the region of Strasbourg, but by attacking France on its northern border across the Ardennes, across Belgium. The problem, however, is that Belgium was perceived by the British to be logically, geographically contiguous. In other words, for the British, anyone attacking Belgium was perceived as a threat for Great Britain's own integrity, sovereignty, independence. So Great Britain was involved in the crisis too. To sum up this idea, the crisis opposing at the very beginning Austria to Serbia did not remain a limited conflict as the other Balkan wars that had broken out in the years before 1914. This crisis escalated into a major war, World War I, because of the rigidity of the then military plans constraining the decisions of policy makers, of decision makers, the military plans constrain the decision makers. And the same, the same analysis, the same explanation has been put forward to explain Operation Desert Storm. You know what happened in 1990? Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, August the 2nd, August 2, 1990. Kuwait refused to accept its defeat. It appealed to the United Nations. The United Nations adopted resolutions, etc. First of all, the United Nations adopted a resolution uh, inviting states to establish an economic embargo. Economic sanctions were adopted to try to force Saddam Hussein to withdraw. The Americans went beyond, they also sent troops to the Saudi Arabian desert, to some extent, to prevent Saddam Hussein from expanding and from attacking Saudi Arabia, not merely Kuwait. This deployment of American troops was called Operation Desert Shield. Desert Shield, a defensive operation. We established a shield to prevent Saddam Hussein from uh, attacking Saudi Arabia. The UN had adopted economic sanctions. Economic sanctions work, if they work, after a long period. The consequences of economic embargoes do not appear immediately, of course. What does that mean? This means that in order for economic sanctions to have a chance to be efficient, the American troops, should have remained a fairly long time in the Saudi Arabian desert without, of course, attacking. Because you had to wait to know, wait and see, wait to know whether economic embargo was successful. In other words, the American troops, once deployed, had the choice of either waiting pretty long or withdrawing 
or attacking for the very simple reason that they could not, of course, remain passive over a long span of time. According to the organizational process model, Operation Desert Shield implied, implied Operation Desert Storm, that is to say the offensive attack. Why? Because due to logistic reasons, the American army could not wait in the Saudi Arabian desert too long because of the temperatures, etc., etc., because of the heat. So once deployed, according to this model, the final decision maker, that is to say George Bush father, could not but sooner or later decided to attack. Of course, George Bush respected the UN resolutions. A real resolution permitting such a resort to violence was adopted in November. The Americans waited until the deadline of January 18, but they immediately attacked on January 18. In other words, Operation Desert Storm, the offensive operation, which permitted to push Saddam Hussein back into, into Iraq. Operation Desert Storm decided in January, or launched in January, at the point of time T plus one, was included in the decision Desert Shield, the decision to deploy Desert Shield, taken at the point in time T. That is to say, in August, September, 1990. But these two examples do not mean that wars are due to organization constraints. They mean that sometimes political leaders are constrained by military requirements, and to some extent by military routines. These military routines, these military patterns make a perfectly rational choice impossible. If you go back to George Herbert Bush, he could have decided to withdraw. This would have had a political cost for him, but strictly speaking, in absolute terms, it was not impossible. He nevertheless was constrained by the military routine the military constraint, the military plans. So the rational choice, which claims that Seisman can take into account all the different alternative possibilities before opting for the, more, the most rational one or the best one or the least or bad one, this rational model actually is no longer possible. A perfectly rational choice is not always possible because of these military constraints. Sometimes, when a state is in a conflict with another state, the rigidity of military programs exclude peaceful resolution of the conflict. But these military constraints, these military uh, rigidity is merely an, a, an immediate and not a fundamental cause of war. The von Schlieffen plan existed because of the French German rigidity, with a result of the French-German rivalry. Without this rivalry, there would have been no rigidity of the German uh, plans to attack France. If Bush was eager to intervene against Kuwait, and if he decided to launch first Desert Shield, without Desert Shield, there would have been no Desert Storm. It is because Kuwait's attack by Kuwait, by Iraq, was perceived by George Bush as a threat to the regional stability and all the stability of the oil market because of America's dependence on, at that time, on uh, the oil imported from the Middle East. So, to sum up this first point, organizational constraints are a contributing factor, but not a fundamental cause of wars when they break out. And the same, I think is true of psychological explanations, of psychological causes, of psychological uh, factors. So psychological explanations arise from the fact that, from the second criticism that I mentioned some minutes ago, the first criticism 
emphasizes sociological constraints, sociology of organizations, psychological explanations focus on cognitive processes, on cognitive biases that characterize decision-making processes and that prevent perfect rationality from prevailing. In other words, in this explanation, the basic starting point consists in saying that the reality which statesmen or stateswomen are coping with, this reality is not perceived as it objectively is, but it is perceived subjectively. And therefore, these perceptions are pretty often misperceptions. The author here is Robert Jervis, perception and misperception in international politics. Perception and misperception in international politics. So according to Jervis, Misperceptions are wrong, inaccurate, inadequate perceptions, subjective perceptions of an objective reality. That is to say, when confronted to an objective reality, a statesman or a stateswoman may be victim of inaccurate, inadequate visions of miscalculations, of inaccurate conclusions. They regard the state's adversary's intentions, the state's adversary's resources. They concern also third party state's intentions. And they may concern even the vision of war, globally speaking, in general. In other words, there is not necessarily an absence of rationality, but a limited rationality because of cognitive processes. Ladies and gentlemen, in general, this goes back to social psychology. Leon Festinger is the author he proposed in the 50s, what he called cognitive dissonance. The reality in our everyday life, and this is all the more so true for statesmen in their political life, the reality is complex. So when we cope with reality, in order to maintain what psychologists call the cognitive consonance, that is to say a kind of psychological comfort, we are happy when we are comfortable. So in order to maintain this psychological comfort, when we see or when we receive an information which contradicts what we believe about the reality we have to cope with, what do we do? We reinterpret this information in order for the information to be consistent with our pre-established beliefs, with our internalized convictions, with our visions of the world we are living in. So everybody, you and me, every average people and political decision makers, perceive reality not as it really is, but as he or she would like it to be. On the basis of his or her pre-established beliefs, ideas, images. So what do we do? We do satisfy with the first interpretation which permits us to maintain the comfort. We do not look for alternative explanations or interpretations. Of course, these cognitive biases differ from one person to another. They depend on our childhood, on the experiences, negative or positive or the impact of different political events. But whatever the intensity of the impact of these past experiences, they prevent perfect, absolute rationality to prevail. So let's look at the consequences of these cognitive biases upon the decisions to go to war, according to Jervis. Statesmen may go to war because of inaccurate judgments of their adversaries' intentions or enemies or resources. 
they may go to war because of wrong discernments of the party state's intentions. And they may go to war because they have mistaken visions of the war itself. First, set of psychological biases having impact upon the risks of war. Sometimes the decision to go to war, to resort to, resort to arms, is facilitated by an inadequate perception of our adversary's intention. Sometimes the statesman overestimates the threat emanating from its adversary. If you overestimate your enemy's intentions, you may be tempted to go to war preventively. You come to the conclusion, I have to go to war very quickly before, given my adversary's intention, before this enemy will be stronger. Maybe George W. Bush's decision in 2003, Iraqi freedom, to go to war against Saddam Hussein, to some extent, can be explained by the fear, the subjective perception, the wrong perception, but nevertheless the perception of George Bush, thinking that Bush, that Saddam Hussein was about to possess weapons of mass destruction. Maybe. A state can also underestimate another state's intentions. In this case, the war is also indirectly facilitated. The outbreak of war is indirectly facilitated. Because, precisely, the adversary being underestimated can come to the conclusion, my enemy, the first state, is not prepared so I can go to war. This is the explanation put forward to explain why World War II broke out. Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister underestimate, underestimated Hitler's true ambitions. He believed wrongly, so his perception was wrong. He believed wrongly that Hitler was merely interested in unifying the German folk, the German people, in one single unity. So he underestimated Hitler's true intentions, Hitler's ambitions to conquer the rest of Europe. And in, in underestimating, he encouraged, to some extent, Hitler to attack Poland after having attacked Austria and Czechoslovakia. And sometimes the misperception concerns your adversary's resources, not intentions, but the resources. That is the thing, that is to say, you may believe that your adversary is weaker than it really is. So you may be tempted to go to war. This is what happens according to this explanation. If we apply it, once again, I do not claim this is the only explanation of the different wars that I mentioned. It is just an explanation credible within the theoretical framework here of misperception. So the Russian-Japanese War of 1905, the Russians were wrongly believing that they were superior, being a white people, they could not imagine that the yellow people could resist them successfully. And this is what happened, and the Russian Navy was crushed by the Japanese. So, misperceptions regarding the enemy. Misperceptions although also regarding third party states. Hitler, when attacking Poland, thought, wrongly, that Germany and that uh, Great Britain and France would not react to Hitler's aggression of Poland. Since they had not reacted when Hitler attacked Austria and Czechoslovakia. Since the Munich Agreement that had been signed by the different European powers had accepted this, these attacks of Czechoslovakia and of Austria in the hope to maintain peace. So Hitler underestimated the willingness of France of, of Germany of, to no longer accept a new invasion of a European country. In 1950, at the beginning of the Cold War, the then American Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, hold a speech where he said that 
America's defensive perimeter in East Asia did not include neither South Korea nor Taiwan. This speech was interpreted by Stalin, by Mao, and by the North Korean dictator, the grandfather of today's dictator, the then North Korea's leader, Kim Il sung as an authorization, an implicit authorization to attack South Korea, since South Korea does not belong, is not within the defensive perimeter that the Americans would defend, I, Kim Il sung may attack. He was wrong. The Americans did not accept it. He perceived wrongly, he interpreted wrongly this speech, this discourse. And in 1990, the American ambassador, April Gatsby was her name in Baghdad, in Iraq, during an interview with Saddam Hussein, told Saddam Hussein that, I quote, America had no opinion, no opinion with regards to inner Arab conflict. No opinion. The inner Arab conflict regarded the conflicts in the first neutral meaning of the term, the conflicts opposing Iraq to the other Arab states who had financed Iraq's war against Iran. And these Arab states, the rich oil states, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the Emirates, etc., of course wanted their money back. But Saddam Hussein refused to pay because he said, I defended the Arab countries from the Persian, the Iranian threat. So there was an inner Arab conflict. And it is this inner Arab conflict that the American ambassador alluded to. America has no opinion. How did Saddam Hussein interpret this, uh, this we have no opinion, America has no opinion? Well, he came to the conclusion that America would not help Kuwait in the case Iraq aggressing Kuwait. Saddam Hussein was wrong. America did not permit this aggression. And Saddam Hussein was wrong twice, or he committed two misperceptions because he also believed that the Soviet Union, 1990, the Cold War is not completely over yet. He thought that the Soviet Union would help him since there was a treaty, a bilateral treaty between the Soviets and Saddam Hussein's Iraq. But the Soviet Union absolutely was not willing and no more able to prevent America from intervening in order to push Saddam Hussein back. The Soviet Union was confronted in 1990 with its own domestic troubles, which ended up in uh, provoking the definitive collapse of the Soviet Union some months later, one year later. And you know, the Berlin Wall at that time, that is to say Eastern Europe had crumbled and Eastern Europe was no longer covered. Third set of misperceptions, Regarding the war itself, the vision that is shared by the majority of people and the majority of statesmen regarding war itself. We saw last week one of the definitions put forward by Clausewitz, war is but the mere continuation of policy by other means. What does that mean? This means that war, at least in the past, maybe no longer nowadays, we'll come back to this in our chapter six. War in the past was considered as to be, to be the normal instrument, as you say, to be a legitimate, no, it was means, instrument of foreign policy, it was normal to go to war. Nobody was shocked when the war broke out. Broke out. Things, I, I think, are different today. In other words, wars, the outbreak of wars was perceived to be inevitable. And if you think that a war will occur, well, you do not bet on diplomatic conflict resolution. You prepare for war. This was the case for Thucydides. I go back to Thucydides' analysis of the Peloponnesian War. He thought that according to Athens, the city-state of Athens, I quote, the, for, the, for the, the, govern, the government of Athens, the coming of the Peloponnesian War was only, I quote, a question of time, a question of time. Sooner or later, such a war would break out, break out. In 1914, the same perception prevailed. The Germans believed that the French sooner or later would want to reconquer Alsace-Lorraine. 
the Germans believed that sooner or later Russia would be that powerful that they would be unable to defeat Russia. Great Britain thought that sooner or later Germany would resort to arms in order to overthrow Great Britain from the world throne. So there was a widely shared belief that sooner or later the war would break out. And this, to some extent, internalized belief favored, promoted climate favorable to the real, the effective outbreak of the war. Since the wars of the 19th century, I told you this last week, I think, the 19th century was a pretty peaceful century, stable century in Europe. Since the war that broke out in the 19th century had been very limited, not at all destructive, they had been short, not many uh, peoples or actually soldiers were killed, there was a generally shared belief in 1914 that if a war would break out, it would be short. It would not kill a lot of victims. All the more so, this would be rationally, economically counterproductive. A book was published by Libra, we'll come back to him in our chapter seven. Norman Engel, The Great Illusion, claiming that in today's world, it is foolish to go to war because the economy will suffer and the economy, we need it to be rich and wealthy. So there was a general held belief that if a war should break out, it would be short. And if you believe that the war is short, or if statesmen believe that the, sh that, that the war is short, well, you are optimistic if you consider that you might launch a war. Of course, we know that this perception was a misperception. 1914, the crisis broke out. The war lasted more than four years. It provoked the death of millions of people, directly or indirectly. So this misperception contributed to the war. But just as for sociological constraints, I do not think that misperceptions are major causes or fundamental causes of war. Once again, they just contribute to worsen a situation and thus to prevent a conflict from being resolved peacefully by non-aggressive, by non-violent means, by peaceful means, diplomacy, negotiations, bargaining, etc. Let's look at World War II. Imagine that Chamberlain, that the French Prime Minister, first uh, Front Populaire, Leon Blum, and a bit later Balladier, he who signed the Munich Agreement. Let's imagine that the British and the French had correctly perceived Hitler's intentions. Let's imagine that they would not have been victims of misperception. Let's imagine that they would not have underestimated Hitler's intentions. In this case, the war would have broken out nevertheless, even earlier, because logically, rationally, France and Great Britain would have launched a war before Hitler became too strong. So whether the perception is right, or whether the perception is wrong, a war may break out or not. In other words, misperceptions are not necessarily a discriminatory factor. In other words, there is no unambiguous impact of perceptions, be they right or wrong, be they misperceptions, in other words. And this is Jervis's own conclusion. This is Jervis's own conclusion. It is impossible, I quote, it is impossible to draw firm generalizations about the relationships between war and misperception. It is impossible to draw general conclusions regarding the impact of misperceptions upon the risks of war, upon the possibilities of war to break out. So let's sum up what we saw until now in this chapter. Human nature can hardly be considered as a cause of war. Human nature does not permit us to explain why wars sometimes break out and why not. Organizational constraints, cognitive or psychological biases are at best triggering causes of why wars break out, but they do not explain the fundamental causes of war. Therefore, I come to the conclusion, we should, we should consider war as a rational activity. A rational activity in the instrumental track 
rational, this is Max Weber's expression, in the instrumental meaning of the term, conception of rationality. A statesman is rational if eager to obtain this or that result, he uses the result to war if within the more or less perfect or imperfect information at his or her disposal and whatever his cognitive biases, if within these constraints he acts consistently. And this is exactly, in other words, if war is a rational means to the political objective pursued, remember the definition that we gave of war last week, it is a armed violence and armed conflict to which collective units resort in order to obtain satisfaction. What are states looking for? They are looking for the satisfaction of their national interests. They are looking to promote, to defend the national interests. Be this interest defined in terms of security, of economic wealth, of maximizing power, or even of spreading values, ideas, ideologies, doctrines. A state promotes and defends its national interests both by diplomacy and by violence, by diplomatic means and by strategic means. And this is the reason why Raymond considers foreign policy, calls foreign policy the diplomatic strategic conduct of a state on the international scene. What does that mean? This means that a war is rational if it permits a state to achieve what its diplomatic means do not permit a state to achieve. And this is exactly Clausewitz's conception of war. Clausewitz on war, the German original edition from Krieger. Clausewitz considers war, we gave this definition last week, as I quote, the mere continuation of policy by other means. Three more quotes expressing exactly the same idea. War is nothing but a continuation of political intercourse with a mixture of other means, a mixture of other means, violent means, complete diplomatic means to achieve the national interest. One more quote. War is policy in its highest point of view, in its highest point of view, which policy which fights battles instead of writing notes, instead of writing diplomatic reports. And last but not least, maybe the most easy one to remember, war is policy which takes up the sword rather than the pen. These definitions, of course, these uh, quotations, of course, mean that for Clausewitz, war is a rational means, absolutely. But they also mean that war is submitted to political objectives. War is not a means in itself. War is characterized, I quote, by its subordinate nature as a political instrument. War has its own grammar, but it does not have its own logic. It obeys a political logic. It is subordinated to the general policy of a state. This policy is defined as the true appraisal of affairs, the true appraisal of affairs of Deutsch, the Allgemeine Einsicht. In other words, a war is rational, whatever the limits of this rationality, if it responds to political demands, if it permits a state to obtain what said state could not obtain with non-violent means for the very simple reason that violent means are costly and you can never foresee 
that they will be efficient. This is Clausewitz's conception that we that I will share and posit from now onwards. But of course, if I do so, it is also because this hypothesis of war being a rational activity, we saw it last week, wars do not break out accidental by error. I do share and accept and posit this hypothesis, hypothesis because it has been empirically corroborated. That is to say, the wars that broke out in the past can be considered indeed as uh, rational undertakings. This has been proven by an American scholar. His name is Bueno de Mesquita, Bruno Bueno de Mesquita, Bruce, sorry, Bueno de Mesquita. Bruno is not an Italian, he's an Italian but not an American first name, so it's Bruce Bueno de Mesquita, who published an article in 1980, The Expected Utility Model of War, The Expected Utility Model, concretely. Bueno de Mesquita was a behavioral realist, that is to say, he was interested in why wars broke out. He considered that wars regularly break out, so this is a typical realist claim, there is no possibility of progress, etc. International politics is synonymous with never-ending competition, and sometimes the competition ends up in wars. But being a behavioral, that is to say, quantitative, mainly, uh, theorist, he was eager to prove empirically this, um, this, this claim. So what did he do? He looked at those wars that broke out, and he looked at whether the state initiating, launching the war was rational in the meaning of the state launching this war could expect a positive utility. That is to say, was it true that the state launching a war, the statesman, the stateswoman, could rationally think, anticipate that its situation within the relation with the target state of the war, could the statesman really think that this relation would be better off, would, he would, the state would be better off after the war than before the war and or without the war? In other words, would this war benefit the state launching the war by forcing the other state to do what the first state wanted the second state to do. Remember that war as a social activity aims at forcing your adversary to do what diplomatic means are unable to force this adversary to do. So he tried to know, to look, to check, to corroborate whether this was the case. And of course, he established three criteria permitting to measure the expected utility, to see whether the expected utility was positive or negative. Only in the case of an expected positive utility, the decision to launch a war would be a rational one. So according to Bernard Mesquita, Bruce Bernard Mesquita, this expected utility depends on three major factors. First of all, a state launching a war must believe that it will win. And you believe that you will win a war if you know, or at least think, that you are stronger, or at least as strong as your adversary. If you know that your adversary has more military assets, more military capacities than yourself, it will be irrational for you to launch a war, of course. Second, it is not necessarily the absolute, but it is the relative expectation which is important. That is to say, the utility that you expect does not merely depend on your knowledge of being stronger, but it also depends on your being convinced that the mere diplomatic means will not permit you to obtain satisfaction. In other words, the expected utility depends on the anticipated evolution of 
your relationship with your adversary before a war might break out. If you anticipate that this relationship will improve in the future, there is no need, that is to say, if you believe that your adversary will do what you want it to do, then you do not need to go to war. But if you anticipate a deterioration of your relationship with your adversary, then you logically come to the conclusion that this adversary will not change its policy to fit your expectation. And then you might believe that to go to war is rational because you would not, without a war, obtain satisfaction. And last but not least, the third factor that must be taken into account by statesmen or stateswomen considering war is the anticipated behavior of third party states. A war rally remains a bilateral opposition, confrontation. Therefore, a state considering, or statesman considering the possibility of going to war must think of what other states might do. Other states might join the adversary. Third party states might join your state, or they may, they may remain neutral or try to start uh, uh, to mediate disputes, to look for a peaceful solution. So the possible or not, Involvement of third party states also has an impact on the initial power ratio. If you think that your adversary benefits from the support of third party powers, the initial power ratio will change. In other words, and in short, according to William Mesquita, in order for a war to be rational, the state that considers to launch a war must, before launching this war, have a positive expected utility. That is to say, it must be sure that it is at least as strong at, as it is the same. It must know that it will not obtain satisfaction without going to war. And it must believe or know that third party states will not significantly change the initial uh, advantages power ratio. This model, these hypotheses were empirically tested by Bruce Wilhelminski. He studied the wars enumerated in the Courage of War project, the one I mentioned one week ago, from 1816 after the defeat of Napoleon to 1974, the article was published 1980, so he went up to 1974. So a time span of more than 150 years, and therefore very significant for social sciences. He studied first bilateral wars, one war opposed to another. And he came to the conclusion that 65, out of 76, 65 out of 76 wars of the past indeed were characterized by the state launching this war, these wars, having a positive expected utility. They indeed were stronger than the adversary. They could not think that the adversary would change its policy without going to war. They could rationally believe that by definition, bilateral war, that the war would remain bilateral. And then he undertook another calculation. He looked at those wars that did not remain bilateral. He took into consideration the decisions of third party states joining an initially bilateral war. And he found out that 78 out of 102, 78 of, out of 102, so almost perfectly three quarters, 75% of wars were rational in the meaning of the, the state uh, launching the war, whatever the third party states did or not, the state launching the war could expect a positive utility. Conclusion. Were the Mesquita's empirical quantitative inquiry corroborates translates conception of war as a rational activity. Three wars out of four, 
and a bit more, even at least three fourths out of four, were decided rationally. That is to say, they were decided by states, rightly, or statesmen or stateswomen, rightly believing that the war could permit them to obtain what they were looking for. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen. And the, expected, the positive expected utility is not a sufficient condition for states to go to war. It is not because you think that you will win, that the other one will not uh, do what you wanted to do without going to war, etc., that you will launch a war. It is not a nest, it is not a sufficient, but it is a necessary condition for wars to break out. Only if states believe that they will win, that they will obtain satisfaction, that the third party states will not change the initial power ratio. Only if these three uh, conditions are fulfilled, states go to war the majority of the time. But it's not because they benefit from such favorable conditions that they will go to war. Of course not. So it is a necessary condition in order for a war to occur. A state initiating a war must expect a political benefit from it. I then will start from this hypothesis, which is also shared by the realist scholars in general, the rationalist scholars, as opposed to post-positivist or even to some more or less hard or soft constructivist scholars. Waltz, in his man State and War, summed up this idea the following way, a state will use force if after assessing, after assessing the prospects for success, it values those goals that it is looking for more than it values the pleasures of peace. If you consider that the national interest you're looking for, and if you consider that to obtain it, war is necessary, and if you consider that war, you know, to obtain this, this, this national interest is more important than peace, then you go to war. War is the consequence of a rational calculation. War, wars do not break out accidentally. They are not due, the majority of wars are not due to misperceptions. They are not due to sociological constraints. They are not due to irrational or evil human nature. At least the majority, as I said, three out of four roughly, 75 to 80%. What then about the 20, 25 remaining percent of wars, which according to Bueno de Mesquita's own findings, do not fit the hypothesis. There was no positive expected utility in roughly one war out of four. How can we explain these at first sight, irrational wars, maybe, maybe they were pursuing other goals than the national interest. Maybe they were irrational from the national interest point of view, but rational from other points of view, points of views, and first and foremost, from domestic points of views. We will see next week, ladies and gentlemen, those are theories that ascribe the outbreak of wars to domestic, specific domestic interests, be they private or political, rather than to the national interests. Next week in chapter three, thank you very much for listening today. Have a great day, and I hope you come back in a week. Goodbye.